But before I get there, I want to go back and, and look at this one question, what is the purpose of the book of Revelation? And uh, the book of Revelation actually tells us what its purpose is, but there's a lot of different interpretations of it. And I want to address that because if you go online and you go to different churches and you hear different preachers preach on the book of Revelation, there's kind of uh, at least three takes on this section of Revelation, the seven churches. One is, it's just simply telling us what happened, right? It, it happened, uh, John wrote this letter and it went to the seven churches listed there. I mean, it you know, it's just a historical event. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, and this is probably the most common that I've seen, is the seven churches are actually symbolic of the seven phases the Christian church went through. And it starts out kind of historic and turns into the prophetic. And so the, the church of Ephesus, which was the first church we looked at the last two weeks, uh, that, was the, that was like right, the, right when that letter was being written. That's that time period. Smyrna comes later, and then it, it keeps moving up like that. Phil, if they're calling you to go to work, you tell them you can't go because you told me you were here. Okay. Phil told me he's not working today, so I'm just warning you all. I can preach as long as I want. So right now, it's like, okay, all right. So anyway, so that's, so, so that's kind of the second way. It's just kind of this prophetic word, the seven stages of the church. I don't believe that covers it. Now, God, has, God never has one reason for doing anything. You know, just, he, I love people say, well, God did this because of this. No, God did this for a hundred things. You might know one. So I'm not saying those things can't be true, but I don't think that's really what we need to look at the book of Revelation as. So I'm going to go back to what uh, the, the, the writer of the book of Revelation says as he's being dictated to by the angel of Jesus. He says this, here's the purpose. The angel tells him, write the things which have been, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Now, you can look at that phrase two different ways. One way is, well, it's just historic, right? That's just what this is saying. You can read that exactly what that is. But you can also look at it that the angel is saying this is eternal. Because if I'm saying things were, are, and will be, I'm covering everything, right? And I believe that's what the angel means. I believe the angel is telling us these seven churches of Revelation are actually indicative of what happens in the church over and over and over again until the end times come. And I believe there's lessons to be learned for us today in the seven churches that are spoken of. And that's why I'm preaching on them. I would not bring you out here for a history lesson. I'm not that good of a history teacher. And so I'm not going to, I know a lot of churches do that. You go and I'll tell you some things about what was going on then and give you a little history lesson and talk a couple Greek words and then send you all home. You go, well, wasn't that interesting? You know, little golf clap, let's go home, sing a hymn, and there we're done, right? But I'm not doing that. I, I felt Jesus led me to this, the Spirit led me to this because he wanted this message coming to the church, and I don't think he brought us here for a history lesson. So I'm just warning you right now, and the reason I'm warning you is because of today's subject. Uh, because today we're dealing with the church of Smyrna. And Smyrna is the second church here, Ephesus, and then Smyrna. They're all in what we call Turkey today. But I'm just going to warn you right up front. Ephesus, you know, we talked about last week, and they kind of lost their first love, and they forgot to root idolatry out of their lives, and it was affecting their walk with the Lord. And that certainly affects all of us. Smyrna is a church of persecution. This is not a fun topic. But the reality is, some people in the church will be persecuted for Christ's sake. Some people will suffer for Christ's sake. Now, we have lived kind of a blessed existence in this country because for a long time that wasn't us. But I don't know if you've noticed, things are changing. And I used to think that my whole life was going to go away when I would never see this in my country, but it's happening so fast now, I don't know that maybe one day I will be called to account and, you know, recant Jesus or die. That could be coming for all of us. And so it's important to understand that this is talked about in the Bible, not just once. And I believe that there is a warning here, but there's also an encouragement here. And I hope when we're all done, you feel encouraged and not depressed. But let me talk today about Smyrna which was considered one of the most beautiful cities in the area. Now, it's a quick history lesson. I know I said I wasn't going to do history, but a little, little bit of background. Uh, it was a, a beautiful city on, as almost all these churches are, with a nice, beautiful shoreline. It was kind of on a hill, and so it looked out over the ocean. Uh, it was destroyed and then rebuilt by Alexander the Great. Um, and uh, he called it the Ornament of Asia and tried to rebuild. I don't think he actually finished it before the Rome, Roman Empire starts coming in. They... they they destroyed it, and then they did rebuild it. In fact, Rome referred to it as the city that died yet lives. 
And I want you to remember that phrase as we get into the book of Revelation here in a minute. Uh, But they were a very, very pagan city. They bought into Rome full force. They had a huge shrine there to the temple goddess Roma, which is the goddess of Rome. And then during this period, the emperor of the time, uh, Domitian, he reinstated something that Julius Caesar started where Rome has to worship the emperor. So he's like, I'm a god too. You have to worship me. And so they had on one side of their city a big shrine to Roma, and on the other side of the city, this huge shrine to Domitian, the, the current emperor. And everybody had to worship at those shrines. Those that didn't had problems. Now, the Jews cut a deal with Rome. They said, yeah, we really can't uh, acknowledge any God but Jehovah. So they paid money and made a deal so the Jews did not have to go to the emperor's shrine and offer anything. But they made sure the Christians weren't part of that deal. Because by this time in history, the Jews hated the Christians. And the reason was about 10, 15 years before this, there was a rebellion in Jerusalem. And a bunch of Jews fortified the temple and around the temple to keep Rome out. And Rome crushed it. And a lot of Jews died there and Christians wouldn't fight. They said, we don't worship the temple. We are the temple. We worship Jesus. And from that moment on, the Jews hated the Christians and did everything they could to help Rome persecute Christianity, especially in the city of Smyrna. Now, unlike the other cities we'll be talking about where there's kind of a big church there that the letter would be going to, in Smyrna, there was no church building. Smyrna had to hold their, t- their services in homes. If you wanted to go and worship with the believers in Smyrna, someone would vet you first, make sure you're not a Roman spy. And the day of the service, you would find out where the service was. That's where that little fish symbol comes from. Follow the fish symbol and it leads you to the service. It was different all the time. They could not afford to be open about the worship of Jesus because if so, they were persecuted. And I don't just mean like they called them bad names on Twitter. I mean, they killed them. And so that was the situation in Smyrna. Now, when Paul, I'm sorry, when John is told by Jesus to write the letter, this is what he says. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, and when we talk about the angel of the church, he's talking about whoever's in charge of the church. Angel can mean messenger, not just a heavenly body. So to whoever the elder was there, I, I want you, the first and the last, this is Jesus saying who he is, who was dead and has come to life. And I find that interesting because in every church, Jesus describes them differently. So in the city that Rome said was dead and yet lives, Jesus says, I'm the God who is dead and yet lives. Listen to me, right? So he says, this this is much more important than a city. I'm the God who is dead and yet lives. I have the first and the last. I know your tribulation. I know what's going on there. I know your poverty. And it's ironic because Smyrna, by the way, was an extremely wealthy city, but the Christians there were very, very poor because they had all their rights as citizens stripped from them. They couldn't even get work. So I know your poverty, but let me tell you something. He says, where, where it counts, you're rich. Uh, there was a f- famous, uh, not famous, I guess, but, but in my house it was famous. There was a, a guy who, who uh, worked here uh, for, for some time, and it's, people would ask him, how are you doing? And his answer was always, I'm okay where it counts. Uh, I just love that as an answer, you know, instead of fine. I'm okay where it counts. You're rich where it counts. That's what Jesus is saying. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but they're not. They're from the synagogue of Satan. I see who's persecuting you. And they don't speak for me or my father. They're not part of the chosen people. They're following Satan. Not the first time, by the way, he accused them of that. He did that when he walked here too. He says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Not because I'm going to take you out of the suffering. He says, don't fear, but behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so you'll be tested. Now, you need to know Rome didn't have a prison sentence that lasted for years. You didn't get life imprisonment in Rome. Prison was a holding cell until you were brought to trial, where you were given a fair trial, found guilty, and executed. Right? That's kind of how Rome ran their judicial system. So he says, you're going to be thrown into prison. They know that's the first step to execution. You don't stay in prison. They either let you out for some reason or they kill you. And he goes on and says to him, he says this. He says, um, no, you're not going to do this. <sighs> Excuse me. One second. Well, I switch devices. He says, did to me too? Yes, did too.
Can you move me forward? Uh, I can't seem to move anything. Thank you. And you will have tribulation for 10 days. Now, 10 days is an interesting figure because that's about how long it took to process them into court. So this isn't like saying, don't worry, tribulation won't last long. No, it won't last long because some of them are going to actually be killed. He says, prove yourself faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. The one who has an ear to hear, the Spirit says, let him hear. But watch what Jesus says at the end. The one who overcomes this will not be hurt by the second death. They can kill the body. They will not touch your soul. Stay firm. Prove yourself faithful to the very end. Now, I know I need it. Uh, this is not going to work, Sass. You're going to have to run two things at once. <laughs> We're having some technical difficulties today. But, so there are some people who are probably thinking, okay, I've never really heard Christianity presented the way it's being presented here. Because it's like, you're going to suffer. You're, you're going to be persecuted. It's not fair. I see it. But I'm going to let it happen. And all I'm going to tell you is, please hang in. Hang in there. Right? You're, until, until they kill you, hang in there. And a lot of people probably go, that's not really the way I was taught this whole thing works, right? Because in, in America, we have what I call coffee mug theology. And just a little hint, if your theology fits on a coffee cup, it's insufficient. I'm just going to give you a warning right there, right? So you've probably seen this verse, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. See, it fits right there in a coffee cup. And if you don't like that, you can paraphrase it, I guess, to this it will be worth it. I don't know how that paraphrases into that, but that makes a nice coffee cup too. Don't worry. It's all going to work. And, and, when, and then, then we talk about how God uses these hard things in your life to work things out of it. But don't worry because he's perfecting something in your character that has to be worked out. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes you're you're running for your life and you end up in the wilderness for 40 years while God perfects you and you turn into Moses, the greatest civil leader the world has ever known. Sometimes you're just a kid they're trying to kill and you run and hide in caves for 15 years and you end up being crowned king and you become David, the best king Israel ever knew. Sometimes your name's Joseph and you're thrown into prison, you're sold into slavery and you spend 12 years but then you step and become the most powerful man on earth. But sometimes that's not your story. Sometimes God is working things out through the hardships in your life, but sometimes things aren't going to end well for you. Sometimes it just doesn't end well. Were you that quick or was I, did it? Well, okay, good job. Good job. Just watch my finger. <laughs> when I was a kid, I had this um, record player and this book. And some of you as, as old as me probably had this, right? And it's told the story of Robin Hood. And Alan Adele, when he'd strum his guitar, you were supposed to turn the page of the book. Does they have anything like that these days? That's what this is like, but I don't have a guitar strum. Just watch the finger. Okay. Sometimes don't, things don't end well for us. Sometimes it's like John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist didn't do anything wrong. John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus Christ. His, by the way, birth was also miraculous. It just gets overshadowed because Jesus was a little more miraculous. But John's birth was miraculous. And he grows up and he becomes a great leader and a great evangelist and he prepares the way for Jesus' ministry. A lot of what Jesus does is he's just, he's just reaping the harvest that John planted. John did a lot of work. He was diligent for the Lord. He lived by himself. He fasted and prayed every day and preached and brought the nation to repentance. There's nothing wrong with that. That was a very effective ministry. But then he gets captured and taken to Herod and thrown in prison because Herod's girlfriend doesn't like him because he won't say that Herod can marry her, you know, because he had a queen. So um, she hates him. And so he's captured, he's taken in into prison, and he's there, and he hears the story about his cousin, Jesus, who has started his ministry and is going around doing everything the Messiah is supposed to do. Well, one of the things the Messiah is supposed to do is free the captive. And John keeps waiting for cousin to come by and free him when the cousin doesn't come by to free him. And eventually, he gets tired of waiting for cousin to come by to free him. So he sends his disciples with this message. Um, are you the one who's coming, the Messiah? Or are we looking for another? You can understand his confusion. 
And Jesus answered him. He says, go back to John and report what you see. He says, blind people receive sight, disabled are walking, those who have skin diseases are made clean, deaf people hear, those who are dead are raised to life, and the gospel is being preached to those who are poor. That, by the way, is the mission statement of the Messiah given to us in Isaiah. Blessed, he says, is anyone who does not lose their faith because of me. I'm not here, John, to save your body. I'm here to save your soul. I'm not that kind of a Messiah. The Messiah, you think that I'm going to be a king and I'm going to save us physically, is not who I am. I'm here to save us spiritually. Blessed are you if you don't lose faith because of that. John ends up being beheaded. Sometimes good people die. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. I know we don't like to talk about that, but you have to understand that the earth does not contain the full story of your life. And if you think it does, and if you look at Christianity as a way to make your life here better, you're going to be disappointed because that's never promised to you in the scriptures. Jesus certainly never promised it. We've just been spoiled in this country because for a long time it seemed to be true. But it's not true. And things are changing. So we have to prepare ourselves for this and we start, have to start realigning ourselves and we have to tell ourselves, you know what? This isn't really what Christianity is about, so I have to stop pretending it is. I have to get my mind right. When your belief about Christianity doesn't line up with the Bible teaches about Christianity, don't talk to me about preacher's teaching. I'm talking about the Bible teaching. Guess what's wrong? We need to realign ourselves to what the Bible teaches and that's what John is warning us here in the book of Revelation, but he is not alone. We're going to go back to Smyrna, by the way. Skip the next slide's test. <laughs> back to Smyrna. Now, in Smyrna, this is how they dealt with Christians. They had three things that they would use to tell the Romans, you can go ahead and persecute them, because the Romans tried to be this law and order you know, kind of thing. That was part of what Rome brought to you, was order. So these are the three accusations they brought to them. First of all, they were cannibals. Those Christians are cannibals. Have you ever heard what happens in their last supper? They eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood. That's what they said. They're cannibals. I actually have heard this more recently. Christianity, cannibalism. They also tell them this. They split families up. They don't care. If you get saved, you're supposed to leave your family. They split the family unit, which is really important to Rome. You can't let them do that. And finally, they are politically disloyal because they will not offer a sacrifice to Caesar. They will not utter the word, Caesar is Lord. This was actually so well known that they would actually do that, and Paul's writing about this in the book of Romans. When Paul talks about those people who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, this is what he's talking about. They would literally take him to the statue of, of, of Caesar, put him on their knees, and draw a sword, put it at the base of their neck, and say, you say that he's Lord right now. And Christians were saying, Jesus is Lord and Jesus only, and they killed him. So when Paul says in the book of Romans, confessing with their mouth and, be, and, 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 tra- and showing their faith with their mouth, that's what he's talking about. Not what we think. You know what we think it is? I don't know if you've been in these services. I grew up in the church, so I was in a lot of these services. Some preacher preaches his hellfire and brimstone sermon. And at the end of it, he says, okay, now everybody bow your head, close your eyes. Okay, with every eye closed and every head bowed, If any of you think you might want to become a Christian, just slip up your hand for a second. Okay, I see that hand. I see the hand. Has anybody else been in these services or just me? See that hand. Okay, put him down. No one look around and say quietly this prayer to yourself. Jesus, come into my heart and become my Savior. There, you're saved. Compare that to the Christian who has a sword at his neck and says, you declare Caesar's Lord or you die. It's a little bit different, isn't it? The Christian version here in America. And so that's what we're saying. We're saying they would not do that. But the Smyrna Christian had a choice. They worked out a deal because Rome was tired of killing them. So we're going to take you to the altar of Caesar. And when you get there, you have one simple thing to do. And they explain it real clearly. This is uh, from a letter, but it was breaking it down. A Christian could free himself by simply offering incense to the statue 
of the emperor, praying to the emperor and declaring him as Lord. After making the appropriate sacrifice, the Christians were given a certificate that verified they had participated in their duty and they were allowed to resume the quiet practice of their faith. We'll make it easy for you. Light some incense, say Caesar is Lord, and we'll give you this. Get out of jail car free. But be quiet, because we don't want to hear you worshiping. Go back to your little houses all by yourself and worship. What if that happens with us? What if that happens with us? And you say, well, okay, I know in my heart I'm not believing Caesar is Lord, so doesn't that make it okay? Why would you die for your faith when compromise is so easy? Isn't it better that you live to worship the Lord? Isn't it better that you live in this church where you might be able to reach somebody else for the Lord? Isn't that a better way to live? There's a small little compromise here that doesn't matter anyway because it's not even in, in my heart. In my heart, I know Jesus is Lord. I don't, it doesn't matter what I say. Didn't Paul say that he ate meat sacrificed to idols? I mean, this can't be worse than that, right? Why can't I just do that? All I need to do after that is keep my head down and be silent. What if that's you in a couple years? And you think, well, that'll never happen here. This is America. Have you looked around lately? Have you been seeing what's going on? I don't know if you're paying attention. Let me catch some of you up on what's happening in the country around you. This first picture over here, this guy's name is Chris Pratt. This is a picture of him at the MTV Awards. Christian Pratt goes to Hillsong and is a Christian. In the MTV Awards, when he accepted his award for, well, I don't know what it was, being, I guess, best bare-chested actor or something. It was a really weird award, MTV Awards. But he accepted his award there. He gave this speech where he's telling everybody, this award means nothing. What matters is the award that Jesus will give you. He actually had a testimony as part of this. It went viral. You look it up, it's still there. They haven't yanked it down yet. Chris Pratt talked about his faith and why that made a difference. So they had to shut him up. So they did. So they came for him. And they came for him through his church. They tried to find something on him, they couldn't, so they came to him through his church, in Hillsong Church. Pfft, they hate gays. He goes to that church, therefore he hate gays. And so they're trying to cancel him. Now they didn't succeed in part because they could still make a lot of money off of him. And so Robert Downey Jr. actually supported him. And then quietly, some other people supported him. And they backed the mob down. But it worked. You haven't heard from him since then. He actually issued a statement. And, and to his credit, it wasn't an apology. He, was just, he just simply said, look, my church doesn't hate gays. It's not true. So it's kind of a pseudo-apology. But they, they silenced him. You haven't heard from him since. See, he was smart. This guy here, Chris Harrison, some of you guys know who he is. Some of you are going to look it up, I'll tell you. He's a very powerful man up until about a year ago in Hollywood. He's the host and co-producer of a show called The Bachelor. And it's a powerful show, making millions and millions of dollars because it's got all kinds of spinoffs. It's a cash machine. And he could decide who gets on it, who gets off, who goes from there to Dancing with the Stars. He, had, he, he, was, he's like, he was a kingmaker. He takes people from obscurity and made them celebrities. So in this last season of The Bachelor, The Bachelor, I think, for the first time in history is a black man. And one of the women vying for the rose from the black man is being accused of being racist, which just blows my mind. But... And the reason they're accusing her of racism is because they look back in her college yearbook and she attended a, a, a dance that was the Old South antebellum dance where they dressed up like Gone with the Wind characters. And there, there, was, there was no blackface there or anything like that. It was, it was just a dance celebrating the Southern history and, and heritage. But of course, that includes, if you look deep in the history books, slavery. So clearly she's racist. And they started coming after her. They couldn't find anything on her, so they went to her parents, and they found out their, her parents voted for Donald Trump. So clearly they're all racists. And they start trying to cancel her. And Chris Harris was being interviewed about this. He says, you know what? I think maybe we should give her a little grace and wait, her episode hasn't aired yet, and wait till she does her interviews and ask her these questions and have her tell you what she thinks about all this. 
Well, that wasn't any good. For that, the mobs started coming after him because that's what he said. He didn't say she was right. He didn't even say she wasn't racist. He says, maybe we, we, we wait till we hear her side. No, no, we don't have to hear her side. We've already decided. So the mob came after him. You know what he did? He burned incense in the, in the, in, in the, in the square in front of Caesar. Caesar. He issued his apology. I see now that what I did was absolutely racist. I'm going to step away and be quiet for a year. He's going to try to sneak back in later. Then some of you may have heard about this happen recently. Gina Carano. I don't even know if she's a Christian. MMA fighter turned into Mandalorian star. They came after her because she just would not issue an apology for something she didn't say. And then finally they found this tweet, which I won't bother going into, but they said it was anti-Semitic and a lot of Jews come out and said, no, it wasn't. doesn't matter. They canceled her. Not only did they get her fired off of this hit show, they got her toy canceled from Hasbro, a little action figure, which was the second highest selling action figure they had. These companies want to lose money over this. They took it off. They took it off. By the way, if you want to buy it now, it costs $500 on eBay. It's selling like hotcakes. But they canceled her. Not only her, not from the show, her lawyer dropped her, her talent agency dropped her, and her publicist dropped her. And then they started looking at anybody she's dated in the past to go after them too. They don't just can't you, they destroy you. Because she wouldn't go to Caesar's temple and make the apology. But it's coming for you. Do you understand Christianity is on a list, right? If you look at some of the sites, which I won't name because they're politically charged, but if you look at some of the sites, they're right open on it. They want to end the nuclear family. They don't like that. They want to end Christianity. They don't like that. In fact, Christianity is a white privilege. I read that. That would probably shock the Jews, but uh, that's what it says. They're coming after you too. Our, our, our country right now is balanced on a knife. It really could go either way, but the momentum right now considering that this is all being codified now by law from the White House, is going the other way. It may not be long before you're hauled before the mob and say, you're not really a Christian, are you? What are you going to do in that day? Well, if I keep holding in my heart that Jesus is real, I guess I can say whatever I want. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you right now that doesn't work, and I'm going to tell you it doesn't work because of what the Scriptures say. And then we're going to skip over some stuff here again trying to find here and come up to the, the Martin Luther King slide. This was interesting. I found this, this quote from Martin Luther King. He said, we are going to have to repent in this generation. He's talking the 60s. For the, not merely for the hateful words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Because there's a lot of really good people right now who are afraid to speak up. And he's right. He was right then. He's right now. But all that really matters is what we believe in your heart, right? Isn't that what the Bible teaches? Hold it in your heart and you're okay? Well, no. Jesus says this, therefore whoever confesses me before men, confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. It's not just what you hold in your heart. Because what's in your heart needs to come out of your mouth and your actions, both. Jesus is really clear. This isn't, Christianity is not a hidden religion. It's never supposed to be. Romans uh, 10, Paul writes this. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with his mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. You cannot have both unless you believe it and you speak it. Just so we're clear, if the mob ever comes, you cannot deny Jesus with your lips and expect him to be okay with it when you get to heaven. And this is hard if you're only looking at this life as what matters. It makes it a little bit easier to understand if you realize this is whole thing is as a preparation for what is to come. But if you remain silent, the fruit of your heart will die on the vine. It doesn't matter what you believe if you're not willing to confess. It also doesn't matter what you believe if you're not willing to do something about it. This is what Jesus says in the Luke. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. 
you know, if, you, if you're ever in a bad situation, and <laughs> this is, I hate when I have to preach this part because it's kind of stuff I have to worry about. I'm actually preaching to me. But when something bad happens to you, if it comes out as bitterness and curse words and a bunch of things you wouldn't want ever to be heard in church or even the line at Walmart, if, if, if that's actually coming out of your, your mouth, that means it's in your heart. That's what Jesus is saying here. If, if you kick a bucket of water, guess what comes out? Water. If you kick a bucket of acid, guess what comes out? If acid's coming out of your mouth, it's in your heart. That's what Jesus said. Your mouth will tell you what's in your heart in case you're wondering. But do you measure your faith by the prayers that God answers for you? Because that's how we're taught to measure our faith, isn't it? Here's how I know I'm in God's will. When I pray, he answers. And, and they'll even tell you if you're, if you're praying for something that's not being answered, you better check something's wrong here, right? If you're praying for a healing that's not coming, it must be something you're doing wrong. There, there must be something in your life that's causing this. Because if you were right with God, he'd be answering your prayer. And since he's not answering your prayer, you're not right with God. And therefore, there must be something wrong with your faith. Isn't this what we're taught? Haven't you heard this? I have my whole life. You can't measure your faith by how many prayers God has answered for you. That's not biblical. That's American. We want to believe it. Just like we want to believe that if someone has a lot of really lousy things happening in their life, it's because they're evil, wicked people. And we want to believe that because then we just don't have to be evil, wicked people, and that won't happen to us. We want to think that we're completely in control of what will happen to us in our lives. But that's never preaching the gospel. That's not what we're preached. We're preached to believe in Jesus, to confess him with our mouth, and to live the life of a disciple, no matter what happens to us. And if our faith is only based on God's answered prayers, then it's just a transaction. Right? Parents, you buy gifts for your kids for Christmas. Is that the only time you want to be hugged? Do you want your love with your child to be based on what you bought him for Christmas this year? Or is a relationship supposed to transcend that? This is, this is what the Bible teaches, and, and somehow we've gotten away from that. I, I don't know. This kind of stuff is all throughout the Bible. It's like I, not like I had to go searching for this. I cut verses out of this sermon because I didn't want to preach for two hours, even though I, I didn't know if Phil wasn't working today. I would have. I would have kept all the sermons in. We would have. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are those. Good for you, he says. Yay. Rejoice. You've been persecuted for righteousness. You know why? Because what happens on this earth doesn't matter. You get the kingdom of heaven. You're trading something that's temporal and temporary for something that's permanent and forever. As Jim Elliott put it, he is no fool who sacrifices that which he cannot keep to get that which he cannot lose. That's all throughout the Bible. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kind of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. Leave this with the prophets, he said. You shouldn't be too surprised by that. We should be okay with this. Peter says this, who's going to hurt you if you really do good? Well, okay, suppose you do suffer for what's right. Well, then you'll be blessed. Don't fear what others say they will do to hurt you. Don't be afraid. But make sure that in your heart you honor Christ as Lord and always be ready to give an answer, heart and tongue. This is throughout the Bible. In your heart and be ready to give an answer. Whenever they ask you why you have your faith, give them the reason, but do it gently and with respect. That's what we're taught. Now, there's another promise in the Bible that absolutely nobody ever, ever circles. And I, I, I do this, I don't know if you were taught to this. I, I went through something and they said, you know, when you can underline verses in the Bible, but when you feel there's a promise in the Bible that you're going to hold on to, circle it, right? I do that. No one circles this one, though. Give me the slide after this one. There you go. This is Jesus now. These are the red words of your Bible. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you'll have peace. Well, good, I want some peace, Jesus. Give it to me. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. Okay, that's not giving me any peace, Jesus. <laughs> that's not working for me. He says, no, no, you're, you're going to have problems in this world. But it's okay because I've overcome this world. This world doesn't matter. What matters is the next world. We have to understand that we will have tribulation. Christianity is a religion that uses the present to prepare us for the future. That's what we're here for. 
we are here to prepare for heaven. As somebody put it once, I didn't get saved to breathe easy. I got saved to arrive to heaven breathless. Our job is to prepare for heaven. And if, if you lose sight of that, you're going to be disappointed in Jesus, just like John was. Are you the Messiah or not? I am, he says. I'm saving you for eternity. This life doesn't matter other than that. In the Bible, there's a story about Jesus who's walking along, and there are 10 lepers at a distance crying out to him. Now, leprosy was a death sentence in those days. They didn't know how to stop it. If you got it, it just eats away your skin. It actually just eats away your skin, and you just slowly lose piece by piece. It's a slow death. So if you got it, you were not allowed to be anywhere near anybody who didn't have it. In fact, when you had leprosy, you would be declared unclean by the temple, and they would give you a bell. That was the last gift that temple was going to give you. And you had to ring it wherever you went so people knew you were coming could stay away. Ten of them. This is a plague. <laughs> Ten. One's bad. Ten's a plague. Are, are coming up near Jesus, bells ringing, and says, have mercy on us, son of man, which is a phrase for the, the Messiah. And Jesus stops freaking everybody out, walks over to them. Nobody does that. And Jesus looks at all 10 of them and says, here's what I want you to do. Go present yourself to the temple. Now, he doesn't say he's healing them. He says, this is what I want you to do. Go to the temple and present yourself to the priest. Well, they've already been to the temple and presented themselves to the priest. That's why they're here. The priest kicked them out. They probably were wondering, what's this about? But if I have to go there and have him declare me unclean again in order to come back and maybe get healed, I'll do it. I'll do whatever I have to do because this is a death sentence and there's no other way out. So all 10 of them said, okay. And they start walking to the temple. On the way there, they look down, they see the leprosy is gone. Do you know not one of them makes it to the temple? Jesus told all 10 of them to go. Not one of them makes it there. Nine of them went, wow. They went home. One of them said, wow, I need to thank Jesus. And he goes running back. You know, Jesus sees this guy you know, running, no, no, no leprosy now, probably no bell. He falls down on, on the ground in front of him. Thank you, thank you. And Jesus says, huh, I thought I healed 10 of you. Only one came back. And then that guy followed him after that. It's a cool story. It really happened. But there's something you need to remember. All 10 of those lepers are dead today. All 10. They were all healed, but today they're all dead. We don't know when they died, but I know they're not around because they'd be talking about it if they were. They're gone. One of them, though, is with Jesus in heaven. Do you see? Every healing that happens on earth is temporary. That's all. For, for a brief moment. Eventually, we all die. This death's going to happen. Jesus says, that's why you have to worry about the next death. Everybody's going to die here. I'm going to save you forever. That's the one that matters. You need to get your mind in the game here. Christianity is not about today. Christianity is about preparing today for tomorrow. And if you don't see that, then you're just going to be disappointed in Jesus. Last story. And we'll wind up here. Jesus has three really good friends. Doesn't have many, but he has three. One's named Mary, one's named Martha, and one's named Lazarus. And we see him hanging out with them a couple times in the book of John. And Lazarus gets sick. And Martha sends a message to Jesus who's in the next town and says, Lazarus, your friend, whom you love, is sick unto death. And Jesus does not hurry over. By the time Jesus finally gets there, Lazarus is dead. Boy, that's a disappointment, right? I, I told you in plenty of time, Jesus. And when he, she hears Jesus is outside the city coming in, she rushes out to meet him and she says this, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you'd been here, he would not have died. You could have stopped it. I know even now your father will give you whatever you ask because I know who you are. And Jesus says, 
your brother's going to rise again. And she goes, I know, I know, I know. Someday in the resurrection, he'll rise again. I know that. I like how we just kind of blow that off, right? <laughs> what have you done for me lately, Lord? Yeah, you died for my sins, but what have you done for me lately? Because I've done a lot for you, you know. I liked you on Facebook. I went to that boring Bible study. You know, I prayed even though I didn't want to. I've done a lot for you. What have you done for me lately, right? That's how we are. Yeah, 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 I know. He's going to rise again, rise again in the resurrection day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me, even though they die, will live. And then he looks there and says, do you believe this? See, that's really kind of the whole critical question of all of this. Do you believe this? Do you believe that even if you die, you will live? Do you believe that what Jesus said is true and there's a heaven after all this? Do you believe it or not? Because I think a lot of Christians don't. They live as they don't. They don't really believe it at all. Do you believe that Jesus told a truth and a new life awaits you? Because if you do, you understand why when the persecution comes and they say, is Jesus Lord? Your answer has to be yes. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. You can do whatever you want to me. I will never say anything else because it's true. Would you all please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have been with us through all this and that you continue to reach out to us. We don't want to go through persecution, Lord. Be honest. If there's anything we could do to work to prevent it, we'd like to know what it is. But if it comes, Lord, give us the faith. Give us the vision. Let us see heaven for what it is. And let us stay true to you like Smyrna was. Because we want to be with you forever. For I ask this in Jesus' name.